Income Tax 2023-2024, Small Business How to Pay Income Tax Tax Software Example. Get ready and some coffee because we're going to stop the tax man in his tracks with income tax preparation. We'll possibly not stop him in his tracks, but we're going to try to, we're going to slow him down. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our form 1040 example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, great tool to run scenarios with. You can also find forms, instructions, schedules at the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Standard starting point here. We got Adam tax man just trying to avoid a dang tax man living in beverly hills 90210 single filer no dependents to start off with we're going to be starting off with w2 income at the 100,000 standard deduction for the single filer 13,850 bringing us to the taxable income 86,150 we can see that mirrored in our income tax formula the 100,000 standard deduction 13,850 we've got the 86,150 our point of focus is now the tax calculation the 14,266 which we can see here that being pulled from page 2 of the form 1040 here's that 14,266 uh, let's go back to page 1 and our focus at this point in time is that calculation of the income tax but just to remember and recap when we think about the income tax formula the first half of the form 1040 or the first page of the form 1040 is basically the income statement part of the calculation getting us down to that bottom line of the income statement part of the tax formula calculation that being taxable income this is the part of the calculation that we can mirror in something like excel to double check the data input that we are putting into the system this is the part of the calculation often provided to us largely by external documentation such as the w-2s the uh, 1099s and so on and so forth it's useful to have a double check of that number because we don't have for example the internal control of a double entry accounting system to help us reduce the likelihood of making data input errors therefore double checking up to this number is going to help us to make sure that we did the data input properly and so that's what we've looked at in prior presentations and i would use something like this worksheet for that type of double check due to the fact that we don't have that internal control with which we do have in a bookkeeping system for a business for example with the accounting equation with the double entry accounting system once we get to that number then we're reliant oftentimes in large part on the software to do this actual calculation because the calculation is quite complex meaning we have to do the calculation not based on a tax rate it looks like i'm multiplying by a tax rate here but i'm not this is actually calculating the average tax between these two numbers uh, and we might have to be breaking out sometimes income that is subject to certain rules and limitations such as different tax rates like the qualified dividends possibly and the long-term capital gains rates so in the software then what happens is we can double check this number i can then go to page two and use the software to help me calculate this number now the software here will give us our worksheet we've looked at in the prior presentations the idea that when we used to have paper filing or if we were to still file by paper then up to say i believe a hundred thousand the 
tax system or the tax code has put together tables. Now the tables still have this tax bracket format. You can see this tax bracket format in here in the software is giving us the relevant breakouts so I can see the income that was subject to the 10%, 12%, and 22% tax rates. But if I was to just pull this in from the table, I could look up my filing status and the number you know, from the table to pull in basically these tax rates, get in essence uh, the tax calculation. And if I was over 100,000, then I'd have to use a worksheet that looks more like these brackets. Again, the software basically helping us to do that, helping us to see what is actually happening here by breaking out uh, these numbers into the, their, their brackets. So that's gonna be our progressive tax system. It's fairly complex to actually calculate that because what you would have to do, of course, what it is doing here is saying, here's the, here's the 11,000 that's being taxed at the 10%. So if I go back on over and I pull out the trustee calculator, let's pull out the trustee calculator, then we're saying, okay, and then we're, we're above this, this end bit here. So now we're gonna say the 44,725 minus the 11,000, 11,001 is going to give us the 33,725 about. It's going to be taxed at the 0.12%. That's where this number is coming from. And then our highest tax bracket then is going to be that 22% uh, that we see there. That's going to be our marginal bracket rate as opposed to this number, which is going to be our average rate. Now, just a quick recap, that is useful because when you're talking to clients that might have more income later, what you want to be able to know is they're not going to be taxed at the average rate. They're going to be taxed at their highest tax bracket, at the margin, which is an economic term. We, we make decisions at the margin because that's what's going to be impacting the next step from here. And, and so that's going to be at the highest tax bracket. And then a lot of software will also tell us ordinary, ordinary income would have to increase by 9,255 to begin being taxed at the next bracket, 24%. So we're at the margin. If your income goes up, then you're going to be taxed more at the 22%, not the average tax rate, but the marginal tax rate. If you go over this amount, you're going to be taxed at, you know, the 24 uh, tax rate. So that's really important we talked about that in a prior section or course when we when we looked at the marginal tax bracket versus the uh, average tax bracket for uh, projections now uh, if i was to change the filing status just remember these these brackets just remember that those brackets are going to of course change based on the filing status so if i went back on over here and i went to say uh, head of household I'm not going to add a dependent. You would need typically and a dependent to do that, but just to see the calculations from this standpoint. So now we have uh, different tables because the head of households a more favorable, uh, more favorable status and has different tables here. So remember that that is largely often dependent upon whether we have a dependent or not to go from the single filing status to head of household, which could give us the benefit of the dependent, which might be like a child tax credit or an other dependent credit, but also change uh, the tax brackets possibly for us. Two children doesn't put us into a different bracket. We've talked about that before, uh, or two dependents, right? But that going from single to head of household could. If I went to married filing joint, then again, that's going to impact the brackets over here. So that actually gets quite complex because now we have progressive tax brackets and we have different progressive tax brackets based on filing status obviously with two married people remember historically what would have happened is they would have thought well you're still only going to have one income because the idea was they're going to have a family and then so you're still going to have basically reliant on one income so it was like a different kind of structure of the tax. But now, of course, the idea would be, well, they could have two incomes, doubling the income, which we don't want to discourage people getting married. So you would think all the tax brackets would have to be adjusted to account for the fact that they would have possibly twice as much income, right, in order to not discourage people that were both working to basically get married, which is a which is, you know, common scenario these days. So we talked about that in prior presentations. So those tax brackets will, of course, change 
uh, with filing status, but all the tax brackets are going to have that progressive tax uh, structure. All right, let's go back to the uh, single here, and then let's add another complication. We're going to say, okay, there's a couple things that are going to be taxed at not ordinary income, but rather at favorable tax rates, one of those being dividends, right? So we could say dividends, we're going to say corporation one had dividends of $100 and they were all, let's put $1,000, $1,000 and they were all qualified. So all qualified dividends. So if I go back on over here, I could say, what happened? Well, now I have $1,000 that is now in the ordinary dividends that pulls into my taxable income. If I was to double check that in my worksheet, I would have gotten a 1099 for it typically. And so I'd say on my, my income side of the worksheet, I had dividend income, which I'll just put $1,000. It was all qualified. So I can pull that over and double check my total income line at 101. So I can go over here and say, okay, I did my data input correctly. 101. We still have a 13,850 standard deduction. So the taxable income, 87,150. I can check that number, 87,150. It looks like I did my data input correctly because I checked it in two places, but I'm missing the nuance of the tax calculation because if you look at it here, you'd say, okay, well, that's just going to be taxed according to the progressive tax system. But if I go to page two and look at the actual tax calculation, you can see it's much more complicated of a worksheet. It's not just giving me those tax brackets because it's basically pulling out that 100,000 and taxing it at a favorable rate. So this gets quite complex and ugly looking here, right? We have a basically a different progressive tax structure, meaning what wants what the tax code basically wants to do is give a favorable tax rate no matter what progressive tax bracket we are in, which means it has to have a whole different set of progressive tax brackets for the qualified dividends, which are all favorable given whatever actual ordinary income progressive tax bracket we're in. So clearly what we need to know from a data input standpoint is that although I'm not kind of, I'm, I'm oftentimes as a tax preparer, not I'm relying on the software to do this calculation, I need to be able to understand and tell people, of course, why does it matter if it's qualified dividend or or not? Uh, because although you can't see it here on the first page, it's being broken out of your taxable income and taxed at favorable tax rates, which you can see if you dig into the weeds of this worksheet. Similarly, with long-term capital gains. So, right. So, if I took if I went back in here and I said. Uh, duh, duh, duh. let's let's remove that and that brings me back to my normal calculation where i have this nice easy all right that looks nice and simple well comparatively simple <laughs> if i go back on over and said we had a dividend income or something like that uh, i'm sorry schedule d uh income which is going to be what is the schedule d it is here and we're going to say it was just shares that we sold shares of stock on 060123 let's say we sold it for a thousand dollars and uh the date sold i'm sorry date acquired i'm going to say negative 0601 so it was over a year and then 060123 and then let's say this was over a year this is going to be here okay and then we sold it for 1001 and we bought it for a dollar. So it's gonna be a thousand dollars again if I go back on over. So now we have the schedule D popping up here. So we have the schedule D. Duh, 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 duh. There is the calculation 1000 ultimately rolling in to the form 1040. There it is on the form 1040. Again, I can mirror that over here and say, okay, now I have income that wasn't here. It's over here on my schedule D and I sold it for 1001 and it cost one subtracting that out. There's a thousand dollars that's pulling over to my income. So there's my, my income. There's my taxable income, 87,150. Once again, I can kind of check that 87,150, but also that's going to complicate my calculation once again, because 
we have a similar situation where it messed up the whole calculation because we have to break out that 1000 which we might be able to tax at favorable uh, rates other than the ordinary income uh, rates. So that's what we need to keep in mind when we see this tax calculation. It's very complex, even though it's the thing we don't often think about as much from a data input side when using software, because we're often relying on the software, but we need to have a general understanding of it to double check the data input and so that we can use that knowledge for explaining what is happening as well as tax projections. All right, so now we're gonna imagine a situation if I go to page number two, where we might need to check off this box uh, 8814, so that's the form. So if I go back to page one, let's imagine that we have a dependent now. So that's gonna be Sam Taxman is gonna be uh, son qualifies for the child tax credit, but they're also gonna have some dividend income. So we've, we've input uh, some dividend income for uh, Sam. So if I go then to page two, we're gonna say, here's the tax checked off form 8814. If I go to form 8814, that's where we have the parent's election to report child's interest and dividends. So remember the general idea that if for many people, they're not gonna have a lot of money possibly to provide to a child for their particular investments because if we have cash flow problems, uh, what ends up happening is the first place we're going to put our extra money is probably going to be in a 401k plan if we have access or into an IRA because we get tax benefits for that money. Those are still going into stocks and bonds usually, but they're under the umbrella of a retirement plan and therefore the dividends and interest paid on those stocks and bonds might not be subject to taxes until the point of retirement. If we have more money, then we've maxed out the IRAs, for example, uh, and, and the 401k plans, then most taxpayers might put more money into the stocks and bonds possibly that are outside of the umbrella of an IRA. And in that case, you would be taxed on the dividends and uh, the interest from the pa passive investments. Now, note, we just saw that if we're taxed on it, if they're dividends, we might get a favorable tax rate if they're qualified, but still we might be subject to these progressive tax rates. So if we had the money, we could say, well, why don't I give it to my child and have them file a tax return? And instead of them being at the higher tax brackets, I can give them a bunch of money and just put it in a bank account and they're gonna get a bunch of dividends and interest on it, and they'll be having more income subject to the lower tax brackets here, right? Uh, would be the general idea. So the IRS is gonna be skeptical of that, but, but at the same time, we wanna be able to encourage people to give money to their child just as a, as a learning tool or whatnot. So if they have investments, then how are we gonna deal with those investments of the child who's reporting their taxes on the tax return of the parent well if they're if they're under a certain dollar amount like 2500 maybe we could just include it as part of the the tax preparation for the parent right so now we've got this form 8812 uh, uh, credits for qualified uh, qualifying children and other dependents so hold on a sec that's the wrong form i've got the form 8814 which is uh, parents' election to report child's interest and dividends. So we're gonna imagine here that we have income that came through, we got a 1099, but it was in the social security number, not of the parent, but of the child, but we're gonna basically include it on the parent's tax return. And you can see the calculation here, I put the, the 2000, uh, and then we have the calculation here, amount not taxed at the 1,500, so the tax on the first 2,500 is child interest and dividends. So you can see that limit 2,500 uh, amount not taxed 1,250. And then we're subtracting that out. We get the uh, 7,750 and then tax being calculated at the 10%, which is the $75. So where do I see that calculation? We go back to the form 1040 instead of having the dividends as you might expect kind of being populated here and like dividend income on the income side of things 
because they are getting some benefit as a as an individual kind of uh, that has a different that you would see like in a different tax return. It's being calculated over here on page two within once again the tax calculation. So if I go into the tax calculation, you can see I've removed the other uh, qualified dividends and long term capital gains. So we're back down to these uh, income with the brackets. And then here's the $75 that's pulling in from the form 8814, which is why we have this, this check box here. So that situation might not be so common except for like higher income individuals. But you could have that could quite possibly come up where you have passive income that is in the social security of the child who is possibly uh, a dependent. If the income was over a certain threshold, possibly 2,500, they might have to file their own return, in which case they might have to basically, uh, the question would be if they file their own return, do they have to tax the income on their own return at the parents' tax rates? And is there an impact? Can you still be claiming them as a dependent on uh, the parents tax return. So those are just the things to keep in mind. So now we have a situation where this box is checked. So this is box uh, 4972. And that's when we have a lump sum type distribution. So if I go to uh, 4972, tax on lump sum distributions. So we're talking about typically from uh, a, a retirement type plan like a 401k plan. Usually what happens with those type of plans is that we of course put money into those plans, get a tax benefit, and then we're gonna take the money out in retirement, possibly being required to take it out once we go past a certain age. And we usually don't take all of the money out at that point in time, but rather we're gonna be taking money out of the account. Now, if you have a lump sum distribution where you might be taking all of the money out, then then you might that's when you could have a situation where you have this form 4972. Again, not so much of a usual that might happen like if there's like an inheritance situation with regards to like uh, retirement plans can can complicate uh, situations. And uh, so so I uh, and. Uh, also note that sometimes people want to take the money out of one type of a plan and put it into another plan. So remember the general idea that if you're taking money out of one 401k or something under the umbrella of an IRA and putting it into another one, you want to make sure that that you do a rollover type of distribution so that you, you don't have the tax consequences of being possibly taxed on it in addition to the uh, the possible penalties uh, that could result from that. So in this case, uh, this is also could be subject to a different kind of tax uh, complexity. So it's complete this part to choose a 10 year tax option, meaning in this case, we input the 50,000 that was pulled out, which might be taxed in slightly different way than the ordinary income situation. So let's go back and say, okay, if I if I said I had income, let's say I'm putting 50,000 in here, a large amount for the gross distribution. If we distributed it early, if it was an early distribution, we might be subject to that being included in taxes as well as having a, a penalty on it. But let's say we're in retirement and we have a, a normal, if it was a normal distribution and we were in retirement, then we would think that if it was all taxable, here's the gross distribution, here's the taxable amount. If I go back on over, then now I have included that 50,000 here in the pensions and annuities, increasing my adjusted gross income, increases my taxable income. And on page number two, we have the tax calculation. Here's our tax calculation. It's just being added to my ordinary income. But if we're saying it's a lump sum distribution, and I'm going to indicate that in the software by saying it's a lump sum distribution 4972, then if I go back on over, now we're saying it's not being included in my income on page one, but rather is going to be taxed at different a different calculation on the taxes. So instead of seeing that calculation over here in the tax and credits, that's why we have to add uh, this other form, form 4972, tax on lump sum distributions, 
which is being calculated here using the 10-year tax option, which might come out to a favorable tax. That's why uh, you might see that. And then we have this calculation happening here, which is what's pulling into the form 1040, page two being added in the worksheet in the tax calculation. So that whole thing is would possibly happen not oftentimes, but if you have that type of situation and the reason would be that it's trying to do the calculation on something other than the ordinary income tax rates and therefore it's not being included in uh, income, but rather it is kind of included in income, but it's being, in, but it's being calculated on a separate worksheet so that it can calculate it based on some other method other than ordinary income uh, progressive tax brackets. All right, one more thing just to take a look at here that I want to look at just to look at the form for uh, 8615 because we touched on that in uh, our prior presentation form 8615. This is tax for certain children who have unearned income. So the general idea here being that we have the child, we have a child usually for a more wealthy individuals they have unearned income investments usually in stocks and bonds that are going to produce unearned income usually in the form of interest and dividends if it's over that 2500 then they might have to file you know the tax return so if they file a tax return because they have a significant amount of this unearned uh, income then they might have to file a form 8615 tax for certain children who have unearned income the idea being here that they're, they're they should be taxed at basically their parents rates which are at the higher uh or the higher income tax rates because likely the money that they got from investments are actually coming from the parents and again the irs is trying to stop this idea of taking advantage of lower tax brackets by putting a bunch of money into savings accounts or investments in stocks and bonds under the social security of the child, not to try to help the child to learn to save, but rather just to save on the lower brackets. So that's going to be the idea here. Now, if they have to file a separate tax return, they may still, the question would be, do they still qualify because you're still providing the support for them do they still qualify under the rules of a dependent to to be a dependent on the parent's tax return even though you might have to still file a return for them given the fact that their income is over the threshold and then you have to deal with basically this form so i'm not going to go into that in detail but that's the general idea of it if their income is below a certain threshold possibly you could just add it to the income calculation of the parents return which will show up then on page two of uh the form 1040 in the tax calculation uh worksheet here but if it's over a certain threshold the child might have to file their own return even though they're still a dependent so that they can calculate it they're going to have to add that form and still then the question would be can you still add them as a dependent on basically the parents return is the general idea again usually comes up possibly for more well-off individuals so that's the general idea with this uh tax calculation we're usually going to most of the time we can double check everything on our income tax formula calculation with something like a worksheet to double check the data input and then page two the actual tax calculation will be done by the software but we want to know those nuances especially when there's a different tax uh, calculation because of different rather than ordinary income tax rates usually that happening with something like qualified dividends and capital gains so we can understand what's happening explain what's happening and help with projections knowing what is happening to make decisions in the future